Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian Wars is one of the greatest achievements of Greek culture. It's an attempt to create a science of human things. It's an attempt to find the nature of human society and of the human psyche in the greatest possible, under the greatest possible stress, particularly the stress of war. Um, Thucydides himself represents and is involved with many of the main influences on Greek culture. And his work, although it is not complete, is one of the enduring testaments to the self-consciousness of the ancient Greeks and towards their drive in the direction of self-understanding that gets beyond myth and beyond figurative speech. Now Thucydides himself was a wealthy Athenian. He lived between, roughly speaking, 460 and 400 BC. And his lifetime encompassed the entirety of the Peloponnesian War, the war between Athens and Sparta for supremacy within the mainland of Greece. And this war itself was quite, a, quite lengthy. It lasted from 431 to 404 BC. And Thucydides was actively involved in this war. He was one of the Athenian generals. And he writes from the position of a first-person participant. When he writes about the politicians in Athens, or the crowd which makes the decisions in democratic Athens, or even the soldiers that are involved on the Spartan side and the various subsidiary cities that help both Sparta and Athens. He knows these people intimately. And even when he doesn't know the people themselves personally, he knows them by reputation and he has good connecting evidence to the actual events and the actual statements and the actual people. So Thucydides history is one of the unusual histories in the sense that it's a first-person history. And it's also an attempt to write in a, what we might describe as an objective way. He doesn't want the biases that come with a particular upbringing or a particular nationality to influence his evaluation of history. As he says in the beginning of his history, I wish this to be a possession for all of time. He wishes to write something that will be true about human nature as such, which will give us a glimpse into the nature of people under the greatest possible political duress, under the greatest challenges that society can offer, which is war. Now, Thucydides was well-educated, and he is conversant and in connection with many of the most important tradition, uh, intellectual traditions that are buzzing around Athens during the time of Pericles, the high point, or what might be called the golden age of Athens. He personally knew Anaxagoras, one of the pre-Socratic physicists, one of those people involved in putting together the first secular accounts of nature in the physical sense. And he is also familiar with the sophists. He studied under the sophists. And the sophists are professional rhetoricians who teach a man to speak well, to gain political power and political influence, and the sophists were also involved in undermining the traditional mythological accounts of law and morality and justice. In particular, Thucydides knew the sophist named Protagoras. Protagoras is famous because he was involved in one of the Platonic dialogues. He's one of the most influential um, advocates of what might be called ethical relativism. And Thucydides himself borrowed much from the sophists. He borrowed the idea that human society was essentially secular and this-worldly, had no taste for mythological or kind of divine accounts of the origin of society. In addition, he himself seems to find very little in the way of moral order in the world. The world that Thucydides inhabits is a world of raw political power. And while this may not be clear during peacetime, or this may not be clear when society is moving along in its normal course, during war, the limits of human society are brought to the fore, and the limitations in our ethical conceptions are also made clear. And we'll cover this when, in the actual history that Thucydides narrates. Let's think about these intellectual traditions or these intellectual currents that Thucydides reflects, though, because you can't really understand the context of Thucydides. You can't really understand what he's driving at until you see where Greek society had come from and what was happening, what changes and transformations it was undergoing at the time Thucydides was alive. In the first place, 
the most important of the educators, the most important of the intellectual figures in ancient Greece was Homer, the great epic po uh, poet. He wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Young men were trained up to take their pa place in adult society in, in such a way as to emulate the great heroes described by Homer. Uh, people like Achilles and Agamemnon and Hector are all the, what we would call today in kind of psychological jargon, the role models for young Athenian men. And at one time, at an earlier and more primitive stage of Greek culture, this was appropriate and salutary. But at the point in which Thucydides lives, at the kind of high point of Greek culture under Pericles, the golden age of Athens, these old myths are starting to wear thin. And we see a rejection of them in a number of different ways. In the first place, the sophists reject the earlier mythological accounts of the world, the mythological accounts of virtue, the descriptions of battles as being influenced by divine intervention and things like that. They have a caustic kind of withering skepticism, which on the one hand can be kind of debilitating on account of the fact that it is, uh, that it moves us in the direction of moral nihilism, a, a kind of sheer realpolitik, a kind of power worship. But on the other hand, it's also liberating and tough-minded because it gives us a more this-worldly, a more immediately plausible account of the human condition and of political life. So the sophists are very important as an influence on Thucydides, and they're very important as an influence on Greek intellectual life at this time overall. In particular, sophists teach the art of speech. They teach the art of making arguments for one side of a, of, a, of a political issue or the other. A sophist doesn't, teach you, doesn't claim to teach you the one um, imperishable truth about politics or ethics. He tells you that, look, it's a question of perspective. It's a question of judgment. Different people have different interests or desires. The sophist teaches you how to satisfy your desires by constructing speeches which will persuade either law courts or the people as a whole in the case of a democratic society like Athens. They teach you how to speak effectively, how to manipulate the crowd, or how to manipulate the jury to get the ends that you've decided you want to achieve. And this tendency, um, this mode, or what we might call a science of rhetoric, which is what the, the sophists claim to teach, is clearly reflected in Thucydides. And when I go over his specific style of representing historical reality, uh, I'll discuss this in greater depth. The key thing here is that this is sort of moral skepticism coupled with an uncanny ability to persuade, to write clever, thoughtful, intelligent speeches, which if not ultimately truthful, are at least effective. And effectiveness is what Thucydides, what the whole sophist tradition is all about. A second influence on Thucydides might be called the pre-Socratic physicists. And they're not entirely pre-Socratic. Some of them were actually contemporaries of Socrates, like, say, Anaxagoras. But the pre-Socratic physicists, like Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, were men who attempted to get beyond the earlier mythological accounts of nature. In Greek mythology, we often describe the sun as the chariot of Apollo, the sun god, and that's what the sun really is. At an early phase in Greek culture, when it was relatively primitive, that was a fairly satisfactory account of what the rising and setting of the sun amounted to. But as Greek culture became more self-conscious and more sophisticated, pre-Socratic physicists attempted to account for the sun, account for the moon, account for the earth, account for everything in nature in a purely secular, non-mythological way. One of the greatest breakthroughs in the entire history of the world, and certainly one of the great achievements of Greek culture, is the creation of this first secular knowledge, these non-mythological accounts of nature. Well, what Thucydides is going to do is trying to take this approach, this non-mythological, secular, this-worldly approach to accounting for nature and bring it to his account of human realities, of politics, of war, and of statecraft. So in that respect, he's the kind of godchild or nephew, if not the son, of the pre-Socratic physicists. A final but still important influence on Thucydides is Hippocrates and Hippocratic writings. Those of you who have read the writings of Hippocrates, and I would recommend if you ever get a little extra time, they are well worth your consideration. The writings of Hippocrates attempt to analyze the diseases of the body in this secular, non-mythological, this-worldly way. They are essentially inductive in their procedure. 
The Hippocratic doctor dispassionately observes the various maladies that accompany certain kinds of behavior or certain kinds of diet or certain kinds of climate and tries to draw connections between particular facts of the human condition and particular consequences of those facts. In other words, they are, a sort of, they are working on a sort of primitive scientific medicine. Some of the inferences that they draw are perhaps not satisfactory, but the way in which they draw these inferences by making careful observations and writing down these observations in case studies so that medical science could progress on the basis of accumulated evidence is very important to Thucydides because what he is trying to do for politics is something analogous to what Hippocrates and the Hippocratic writers were trying to do for medicine. He, they were trying to create a body of knowledge, a body of data which would allow them to make more and more effective generalizations about the way the world really works in a medical sense. Well, Thucydides is trying to do that for politics. He says, if I can ac ac accumulate data about how people behave under the greatest of stress, you will find out what politics really amounts to. You'll be able to move from appearance to reality and really understand the nature of political man. So Thucydides represents all of these trends, this secular, this worldly, anti-mythological trend, uh, the kind of caustic skepticism that we associate with the sophists. And in addition, he's also, in some respects, a rival of Homer. In other words, since Homer had been the educator of the Greeks for some centuries after putting together the Iliad and the Odyssey, well, it, and, the, and over time, the inadequacies, inadequacies of Homer had become more and more obvious, it's clear enough that we need someone or some book, some document, some approach to the human condition that will supersede Homer as an educator of human beings about the human condition. And Thucydides thinks that he is a candidate for that job, which is a great aspiration if you stop and think about it. And not only that, but he intends to supersede Homer's poetry with an unapologetic prose. In other words, pro poetry and uh, meter and rhyme is a very appropriate way of, exp uh, of describing the world if you're describing it from a mythological standpoint, from an imaginative or fanciful standpoint. But for someone that wants to be severe and rigorous and serious and empirical, kind of brass tacks, well then the best way to handle that would be in the way that Thucydides does, with a severe, rather forbidding, rather dry style that is prose rather than poetry. In that respect, he's his project is rather similar to that of Socrates. Remember that Socrates also intends, uh, one assumes, or if not Socrates, certainly Plato, intends to be the new teacher of the Greeks, to supersede the bad teaching of Homer. And in fact, he does write a sort of prose which is intended to move us up a notch towards reality. Now, there are many differences between Socrates and Thucydides, and that could occupy a lecture just by itself. But the point is that the time that Thucydides and Socrates live, because they're contemporaries, it is clear to all important thinkers that Homer's time has come and gone, and that he is ripe for a fall. And that is one of the things that Homer and that Thucydides intends to do, to be the new educator of the Greeks. He says in the first book of his unfinished history, because he dies before he manages to complete it, he says that I want this to be a possession for all generations, not for merely a day, but for all people, for all times, because human nature being what it is, when we find ourselves in roughly the same circumstances, the result will be roughly the same consequences. In other words, he believes in a kind of rough and ready cause and effect that can be derived from our empirical inspection of the world. Again, think back about the, the way Hippocrates thinks about the body. If you have someone with a particular kind of disorder of the liver or the spleen or the lungs, you can expect certain similar consequences. Well, what Thucydides is doing is making that kind of assumption, that kind of uh, the idea that the physical material world is connected by rationally discernible causes and effects which are accessible to the person that thinks deeply and observes carefully. It is also tempting to think of, Th of Thucydides as being like a, th uh, a Hippocratic doctor in another way. Whereas the Hippocratic doctor tries to heal the maladies of individual human bodies, we might steal an, uh, a page from Plato's book in the Republic where he says that the city is like the man. And we might say that Thucydides is the doctor of collective 
individuals. He looks at a disease in Greek society, and it, we, it is tempting to identify this disease with the Peloponnesian War itself. And as is, is the case with Hippocratic writings, in this case, it, with many Hippocratic writings, in this case it turns out that the disease is fatal. We haven't gotten to the point where we know how to cure this disease, but it is surely a disease. And he talks about the progress of this internal malady and how it goes from bad to worse and how we might have handled this problem in a better way if we knew a little more about it. If you ever get a chance to look at Hippocrates, you'll find the kind of unedifying fact, which Hippocrates doesn't hesitate to hide from, or which Hippocrates doesn't want to hide from us, that about two-thirds of the time in his case histories, the patient dies. <laughs> I mean, he says, look, he had a, you know, a pain in the lungs, and he had a fever, and then he was sick, and then I gave him an ointment and something else, and then he died. And then, I mean, you'll, you'll see most of the time it, the patient dies. That's part of the, the kind of burden that we take when we engage in the inductive process. At its earliest phases, we have a very limited set of observations, which means that our, our generalizations can only be provisional, will only be as strong as the set of data that we have. What Thucydides says is that all of these processes, these inductive activities, have to start somewhere. He's going to be the first guy to do that. He specifically gives up on the project of Herodotus, the real father of history, who lived about a generation before Thucydides, who he thought was a little bit too loose with evidence. Thucydides carefully interrogates his documents, and instead of having a muse the way Homer does, that comes down and gives him omniscient knowledge about everything that's going on, Thucydides has instead evidence which is a quantum leap if you stop and think about it. The idea of moving from inspiration to hard facts, to good, solid evidence. And with Thucydides doesn't have evidence, he just fesses up and says, look, the evidence is unclear here. It's not so certain, so I'll do my best with it. In addition to that, it's worth considering that Thucydides is in some respects different from contemporary historians. Well, in the first way, he's different because Thucydides is a great prose poet, whereas I suspect that most of our contemporary historians are lacking in that respect. There's not quite the same degree of artistry, even though perhaps there's a good bit more science. Beyond that, though, Thucydides takes as evidence not so much documents, because you've got to remember that there, aren't, there isn't a, a stenographer in every courtroom writing down transcripts of trials, and you can't find out what people were saying on the other side of Greece. What you can do on the other hand, is talk to people that were there. Whereas a modern historian usually interrogates documents and tries to critically evaluate pieces of paper, Thucydides interrogates people and says, okay, were you there? What did you see? And then he starts to make allowances for personal biases, for nationality, for, for wishful thinking, and for simple lapses in memory. So he tries to get as much evidence in the form of people as he can, and then rigorously interrogate it and take that method as far as it goes. All right, so that's, in some respects, an important element of Thucydides. He also does some things in the construction of his history that modern historians just don't do, and these are worth considering. You see the connection to, sophist, to the sophist movement here. Thucydides' history is composed of eight books, and although in the ancient world, a thing like Thucydides' history was written on scrolls of papyrus. They didn't have books in the physical sense that we do, and we just carve it up into books because it's a kind of editorial convenience. The last of these eight books is clearly incomplete, and what's notable about it, it's the only book that's straight narrative without any speeches. In the first seven books, Thucydides actually has speeches written often in direct discourse, the way you would say the transcript of a trial, you know, a lawyer's summation. And these speeches are put in the mouths of the appropriate interlocutors. Now, the problem is that in many cases, Thucydides just comes out and says, well, look, I wasn't there, and I didn't actually hear this speech. And if, even if I did, I couldn't give you a verbatim account of it. And yet, you get direct discourse. I mean, quotation marks and everything. There it is. But Thucydides says, I've studied the science of rhetoric. And I have been a politician and a general myself. I have been involved with political life, and I just had them say what they had to have said in order to be good speakers and in order to be influential politicians. In other words, the idea of a science of rhetoric was common currency in Greece during the time. And as a consequence, Thucydides doesn't feel that he is misrepresenting the facts of the world by putting into the mouths of certain speakers who he may or may not ever have met, and who he oftentimes did not actually hear speak and has no transcript of, gives them a speech in which he makes them say what they should have said, whether they did or not. In some respects, maybe perhaps Thucydides thinks that if they had a lisp or were bad speakers, that perhaps even his, th his history is more real than the thing that he's trying to account for. And this method of constructing speeches clearly shows the influence of his sophist training.
And one of the most important elements of his style shows very clearly the influence of the sophists on his training. And this is called the antithesis. An antithesis is a set of two speeches, or two things, but usually speeches, that are put in direct contrast to each other. First, we have the pro side of any issue, and we have him make a speech in favor of, an argue, uh, of a given policy. And then an, a speaker comes up and is, uh, gives a speech against that same policy. And of course, the sophist taught a young man how to make arguments for both sides of a position. So this would fall very clearly into the sort of training that Thucydides had gotten from the sophists. And it would have been understood as being voracious, even though not based on hard evidence, by anyone who is part of this Greek tradition. All right, so that antithetical style is very important. Moreover, you'll find that there are other elements of poetry combined with prose in Thucydidean history. In the first case, the kind of events he's talking about are really the stuff that epics are made of. If you think about the kind of things that go on in the Trojan War, heroic men doing heroic things and battles being fought over the greatest possible consequences, it's the kind of thing that would be appropriate matter for an epic. And the topic that, that, that Thucydides chooses, he says, is the most important war that was ever, that was ever fought. Um, there had been a tradition in Greece that there was an, you know, in Greek mythology that in the earliest phases of human existence, there had been a golden time. And we had been degenerating ever since that earlier mythological golden period. And Thucydides says, that's hogwash. Don't give me any of that. I'm a hard-headed guy. Actually, Olden times are really barbaric and not very interesting at all. That's one of the things he covers in that first uh, book of the history. And he says, in fact, this war is the most important war ever fought, both for the size of the armies and the number of people involved and the ferocity of the carnage and all the important issues in politics get raised here. So this war is particularly important to talk about and particularly important for the would-be politician to understand. Moreover, not only is this connected to epic, it is also in some respects connected to tragedy. What we see here is, even though the, the, the history itself is incomplete, Thucydides dies before it ends, what we see here, at least in outline, is a discernible tragic form. Those of you who have studied Greek tragedy know that the form of the tragedy is hubris ate moira. In other words, uh, a, a hero with many good qualities but one fatal flaw goes beyond the limits of what he ought to, he transgresses somehow, he f is forced by the nature of his transgression to some catastrophe, there's the catharsis of pity and fear and all that Aristotelian stuff, and at the end, moral order is restored. If you think about the tragedies of Sophocles, for example, where moral order we transgress and then it's restored, as in the case of um, the most important of Sophocles tragedies, um, you'll see that, that tradition. Now, Thucydides has some elements of that form, but the difference is that there's no moral order there to transgress. People will overreach, but it's not an intrinsic moral order. It's more the limitations of human society or the limitations of the human uh, being itself or the limitations of warfare or society or sometimes just dumb luck, blind chance, those things that we can't predict. So there is an overreaching, there is a kind of hubris, and hubris always leads to a fall, but this fall is not necessarily fated unless you want to call the blind determination, determinism of nature fate rather than the gods intervening and you know, punishing the, the evildoer. So he brings together many of the important literary forms of ancient Greece in a prose form that claims to be faithful to the way the world really is. So you can see that this truly is a quantum leap in people's thinking about political life and their understanding of, uh, of the human condition. So we have some element of epic, we have some element of tragedy, we also have some ele element of science and Hippocratic writing, things like that. What he tries to achieve here is a sort of objectivity, independent of imagination or fancy. He, is act uh, he was a, a, actually a general uh, on the Athenian side in this, and he talks about himself in the third person, which is rather intriguing, in book five of, of, of his history. And after saying that, look, he lost a battle, you know, he was, he was a one-trick pony. They, they made him a general. They sent him on in, and of course, he just got there a little bit late and lost the battle to a great Spartan general named Brasidas. As a result, he was exiled for 20 years because the Athenian people were very, very vindictive. I mean, they, they want results, and they didn't ask for, you know, they didn't send you there to mess up. 
Now that 20 year exile gives him plenty of time to gather evidence and talk to the relevant figures about this war, which makes him, if not a perfectly objective observer, an observer who is at least conscious of his biases and trying to compensate for them, trying to be as fair minded as he can. So we get this fusion of art and science, which is a unique facet of this history, and which is what makes this, or at least one of the elements that makes this one of the great achievements of Greek culture. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the actual history itself. In the first book, he talks about the causes of the war. It's, it's often called the archaeology. He talks about the history of ancient Greece from earliest times. And what he does there is explains his method, this method of constructing speeches where he doesn't see it. Uh, well, I, think, I think it was an, uh, a professional baseball umpire that once said, uh, I call him like I see him, and if I don't see him, I make him up. Well, that's kind of what Thucydides does. But it's not as, as, as arbitrary as that. He studied the science of rhetoric. And you could probably do something like this even without prof studying with a professional sophist. Uh, if you imagine someone that you know very well, or two people that you know quite well, you know the kind of arguments that they make. And suppose you were to, to have someone tell you that you heard that, someone, that Mr. A and Mr. B had an argument about something, and you know them very well, and you know what their typical intellectual moves are, and you know how they talk, and you know how they think. Well, you can kind of connect the dots and say, all right, I, I don't even have to be there for it. I kind of know what they said. Or if you've ever seen that, that, uh, that TV show on cable where they have one person from the right and one person from the left, well, if, you, if you're supplied with a topic they're going to argue, you can kind of connect the dots and figure out what they're going to say. It's not that much of a mystery. Now, if you add to that the fact that he knows many of these people, and that he was involved in many of these events, and that he studied the science of rhetoric, you can see how this might asymptotically move towards something that we would call voracious history. So he makes no apologies for his method. He said, I did the best that I could, and I tried to be as objective as I could. And this is really a quantum leap, even if it doesn't meet the canons of contemporary historical practice. Now, he also talks about the apparent reasons for the Peloponnesian War and the real reasons, which is, again, here a contribution to the origins of social science. He says, look, there was a treaty between Athens and Sparta, and they had fought against the Persians and been successful and all kinds of stuff like that. And they had had a, a minor dispute over two subsidiary cities. Uh, Cors uh, I think it's Corsaira and Potidaea. And ostensibly, that's what the Peloponnesian War is about. But in fact, that's not really what it's about. What it's really about is the fact that Athens had become progressively more powerful since the Persian Wars. It had established a navy. It had established a naval empire. It had engaged in commerce and become very wealthy and very influential. And the Spartans used to be number one back at the time of the Persian Wars, and they were gradually losing their relative position of eminence to the new upstart Athenian Empire. And in the long run, he implies at least that this war is inevitable because the real origin of this war lies in Spartan fear of growing Athenian power. And he says, look, if they hadn't argued about this, they would have argued about something else. It's really not about this particular issue. What it is is about the Spartans' fears of the fact that Athens is coming to preeminence in, in Greece. Now, he talks about uh, the origins of the war. He talks about the early battles. And early on, he sketches out the most important of the leaders. And he's very acute and very intelligent about his discussion of crowd psychology and the, and, and the, the, the psychology of leadership. And here, he has clear villains and clear, hero, and, and clear heroes. In other words, there are people that he very clearly admires and people who thinks that, he's un, that he thinks are evil, un, you know, scoundrels, knaves. And, while this may not be the same sort of moral judgment we would expect of Socrates or Plato, some politicians are effective and good for society, and some politicians are incompetent and bad for society, and he's very clear about who is who. In the first case, Pericles is the great figure in Athenian democracy. And what's great about Pericles is that, he re is that although he keeps the forms of the appearance of democracy, in fact, when Pericles is still alive, the government of Athens is, in fact, the government of the first citizen, the most important figure, and that's Pericles. He's a wise, prudent, intelligent ruler. And he gives <clears throat> one of the most influential and uh, famous speeches in Greek history. It's called Pericles' Funeral Oration. It's in book two of, of the uh, Peloponnesian Wars. And what this presents us with is an idealized conception of 
Athenian civic life and the importance that individual citizens have in making democracy possible, in the fact that political participation is not a possibility, but it's an expected attribute of all useful and desirable citizens. He talks about fortitude in war. It's a very moving and very succinct and very beautiful speech. Um, if you read no other part of Thucydides, because it is rather a large book and many people don't have time to plow through four or five hundred pages, Pericles' funeral oration is well worth your time. It might well be compared, if I were ever teaching rhetoric, I would, I would give that to my students and I would also give as a kind of similar analog in our culture, I would compare it to a Lincoln's Gettysburg Address because we have a democratic society here, we're speaking over the bodies of the honored dead, our speeches can't really add very much to their valor and to the importance of their actions. And there are many similarities because they're both extremely eloquent, both of them have a political message, and both of them are given under the greatest possible stress, wartime over the bodies of the dead, a very moving, dramatic passage. In addition to that, he talks in book two about the policy of Pericles. Pericles, the wise, the wise leading citizen, says, look, this war is essentially defensive. If the Spartans will give us peace, for God's sake, take it and stick to the sea because that's what we're strong at. We don't want to fight the Spartans on land. They're too tough there. As long as we control the sea, we are in good shape. He gives prudent, wise, sensible advice. He counsels in a way, I'm going to bring us back to the idea of tragedy, he counsels against hubris. He says, look, don't go on a war of conquest. Keep it as a defensive war. As long as the Spartans stay out of our hair, we are at an advantage. Don't press this war any further than it has to. War is an evil. It is to be avoided. Use your heads, folks. He, conf he, he convinces the people that this is well worth their time, and he is a leading citizen, even though he must occasionally bend with the winds of popular opinion. Another important element of Thucydides is that it's clear that he doesn't think very much of the Athenian people in the sense that they often engage in unwise decision making. Uh, when I taught Plato for another series, someone asked me at the end of the lecture, why is it that the ancients disliked democracy so much? Why is it that democracy got such a bad rap? Well, it got such a bad rap because it collapsed. It destroyed itself. It made all kinds of stupid decisions. And as a result, democracy folded up on itself. And if the inductive project of Thucydides is correct, that we find out about what's a stable society and an unstable society, what's a wise policy and what's an unwise policy, by looking at the actual facts of history, well, in the facts of history, if you look at the Peloponnesian War, it would say democracies are dangerously unstable and run by idiots. This is essentially the reason why, people, why democracy got a bad rep among the ancients. Now, beyond that, there's a very interesting passage in, section, in book two about the plague. The plague hits Athens and uh, the Athenian people being very superstitious and kind of flighty and kind of foolish. Um, they blame it on Pericles, which shows you what we're dealing with here. They fine him, they take him out of office, and they put him back into office because one of the problems with the people of Athens is they flip-flop all the time. They don't know what they want to do. And they're easily swayed by demagogues. They are fortunate to have someone as good as, as Pericles to give them good advice. But when Pericles dies and Cleon, evil, knavish, roguish, demagogic Cleon comes in, he suggests that they do all kinds of oppressive, tyrannical, hubristic stuff. And of course, the entire society collapses because they all say, yeah, that's a great idea, Cleon. So, there is a sense here that the, that the demos of Athens, the people of Athens, are not wise decision makers. It helps us understand, incidentally, why Plato and the Republic is trying to get beyond democracy, why he's trying to supersede the uh, uh, political involvement of all and limit it to political involvement of the wise. Right? Rule by the wise is what he thinks is a good government. Another interesting thing to note about this plague is that Thucydides actually had the plague, so he was actually able to talk in a Hippocratic way about what the onset of it was like, what the symptoms were like, um, what people did when they got it, um, what the chances of survival were like. He's very matter-of-fact about this. And this matter-of-factness lends a certain coldness to this guy's writing. Um, and it's not just in the, the question of the plague. Later on in, in Book 7, there's a massacre at a place called Mycalesis, which is not very important, but um, some Theban soldiers come in and they come to a city and they kill the people, but they also come to a school where little boys are being taught. And they step in and they butcher all the little boys. And the city just knocks it off in about a paragraph and then goes right on. No weeping, no worrying about the human condition, no worrying, oh, why does God allow this? None of that. Jesus says, look, they killed him, they butchered him, and now let's move on. Cold, 
authoritative, severe, right? dispassionate in many respects, almost in, in an unnatural way. And he also gives us that idea about the plague. He says, look, a lot of people were talking about the gods sending the plague. Well, look, check this out. Good people got the plague, and bad people got the plague. And people that sacrificed to the gods got the plague, and people that didn't sacrifice to the gods got the plague. So I can't make any sense of it. So I'm going to leave all the gods out of this. I mean, the belief in the gods is important because it influences social behavior, but I don't want to talk about the gods. Now, th stop and think about this. If this book had been written by Homer, you can be sure that Aphrodite or Zeus or Poseidon or somebody would have sent the plague. You can't just have a plague and have no reason for it. It has to come from the gods. The cities has gotten rid of all that jazz. Says, Look, they had the plague, and that's it. It influenced the war, and that's just the way it is. I don't want to talk about it anymore. The only thing he wants to tell you is that here's the symptoms in case you want to be a Hippocratic doctor. And another important thing he does is talk about the moral and psychological consequences of it. When people were faced with the plague, they despaired. The usual organization of society, the usual expectations about justice evaporated. And he says, look at the human condition and look how evanescent and how fragile moral order is. There's a sense of, of grim reality here. He's, in some respects, quite a pessimistic fellow. Now, beyond that, there are a couple of other noteworthy uh, events in this history. And the, 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 the history uh, of the Peloponnesian War goes on for many years. I can't give you all the events, and all the events aren't all that important, but two stick out. The first is in Book 3. It's uh, the revolt of Mytilene. And Mytilene is a city in Lesbos, and it's w in the Athenian Empire. And they're allied to Athens, and they revolt. They don't like the Athenian yoke, and hell, nobody likes to be oppressed. It makes a certain amount of sense. But the Athenians are enraged by this because they think it's a danger to them and things of that kind. And what they do is the Athenians say, now that we've conquered Mytilene, now that we've got these people in submission, we're going to vote on what to do with them. And what the Athenian demos decides to do, because Pericles is dead at, the, uh, is dead at this point, the, the key figure here by now is... Uh, um, Cleon, the demagogue, well, they decide that they're going to kill every man in Mytilene and they're going to sell all the women and children into slavery. Can you see why democracy gets a bad name? It's genocidal. And it's unabashedly genocidal. And for no good reason, because the people who are condemning, who are condemning all the Mytileneans know for a fact that not everybody was involved in this revolt, but they don't care to, to separate the guilty from the innocent. They're just going to kill everybody and let God sort them out. Or since there are no gods in this, nobody sorts them They just die. Well, the next day, they, they go home. They feel bad about it. The next day, they change their mind. Now, the Mytilineans, naturally, are, are in bad shape because they sent out a, a ship to, with the orders of kill them all. The next day, they decide to vote, and they vote to re rescind that and just kill the, the guilty and not kill everybody. And it's interesting to see the antithetical speeches that are offered here. One speech is given by Cleon. It says, kill them all, kill them all, kill them all. I'm a demagogue. The more blood, the better. That's the kind of way that Creon perhaps was, and certainly the way Thucydides represents him. There's another guy, I think his name is Diodotus, who says, well, look, this may not be a question of justice. It may be a question of expediency. And here's another important Thucydidean theme, the conflict between what is expedient and what is right. And as Thucydides says, look, in practical politics, expediency is what's happening. Don't tell me any more about the right or the ultimate good or any of that platonic stuff. What's expedient is what works. Again, you see the, the, the legacy of sophistry here. Well, Diodotus says, look, it may not be expedient to kill all these people. And he actually convinces the Athenian demos by a very small margin to revoke their decree. And so they send a ship and say, look, get in that ship, start rowing, boys. Get out there and make sure you beat that first ship we sent out. And they save the people of Mytilene by 15 minutes. I mean, it's a real close call. The moral here, or the point of this, is that democracies are unstable. They make bad judgments. In this case, genocide is a question of depraved whim. And he says, that's not just true about the way they handle other people. It's true about the way they handle their own internal policies. In some respects, you could say that Athens is a sort of collective hero, which has many good qualities compared to Sparta. Sparta is traditional. Athens is innovative. Sparta is, is disciplined. Athens is free. These, these differences, these very good qualities in Athens come out in Pericles' funeral oration. But it turns out that these very good qualities also bring with them a sort of fatal flaw, right? Can you see Athens is a sort of a tragic hero? And this fatal flaw is their instability, their foolishness, the fact that they don't have good basis for their political judgments. The consequence of this is that ultimately Athens collapses. Athens loses this war. The hope 
the aspiration of Greek culture is undermined by its own internal flaws. Again, the, the tragic form comes out. A more, a, a, another very important event of Thucydides' history is the revolt of Corsaira. And this is also worth reading. It's kind of fillet of Thucydides. I'll, I'll give you the real high points. And if you get a chance to read it, take a look at book three where he talks about the revolution in Corsaira. What happens is, th is this. The city breaks up into factions, and they lose a reasonable, moderate group of people that want to reconcile the, uh, the populist faction and the oligarchic faction. And as society breaks into faction, and as the possibility of reasonable, uh, of reasonable agreement about moderate uh, policies becomes impossible, civil strife becomes worse and worse. They end up with a civil war in Corsaira. And eventually, of course, it destroys the society entirely, this combat which becomes more and more ruthless and more and more bloody between the oligarchs and the Democrats. Neither of them are any good. All of them are dangerous because they lose a sense of, uh, of the platonic virtue of moderation. Well, when that happens, Thucydides says, and it's a very telling statement, words changed their meaning. Now, that's a very pregnant statement because remember that the idea of the sophist movement is that the, the logos, which is the Greek word for speech, reason, uh, word also, that the logos will liberate us from, the bounds, of, from, uh, from the, the bounds of mythology and convention and allow us to reason out the true facts of the human condition. But the problem is that the logos is a shifting sand as well. And if we build our house on this rationalistic foundation, it turns out to be a foundation of sand. Because under the greatest of stresses, under internal civil war, we find that it begins to shift. And that what used to be prudent moderation is in fact unmanly cowardice. And what used to be ruthless prosecution of immoral advantages becomes a sensible and commendable way of handling politics. And when words start to change their meanings, the logos no longer leads us out of the labyrinth. In fact, it ends up being a dead end. Corsaira is undermined by the Greeks, uh, by Greek culture's rationalistic hubris. And this hubris comes back and destroys them. And this hubris, in an enlarged sense, can be extrapolated to the entirety of the Peloponnesian Wars. The fact that Athens is accessible and open to new ideas and it is part and is, is a, a open to the possibility of bringing in new critiques of ancient myths, turns out to be unstable and dangerous. Words change their meanings. And if we can't depend on the Logos, we can't depend on anything. The Logos got rid of the gods, but we don't have anything to, to take its place. Nothing helps us out of that. Well, Corsaira is a frightening and horrifying realization that our project of liberating ourselves from mythology liberated us, but didn't give us anything to fill the gap. And as a consequence, we're faced with what might be called the terror of history. We're faced with simple brute force. It's not an accident that later writers like Machiavelli and Hobbes were really great fans of Thucydides. As a matter of fact, Hobbes translated the whole of Thucydides' Peloponnesian Wars into English because he thought it was a great book for the statesman, because it shows politics the way it really is. None of this jazz about virtue and, and righteousness and all that. Politics is a matter of power. It's real politique. Bigger, big fish eat little fish. That's the way the physical world is. Stop kidding yourself. All right, so. We can see that realpolitik goes all the way back to this Thucydidean hard-headedness. And a final thing, uh, the final passage, the final event in the history that I want to talk about is called the Melian Dialogue. One of the beautiful, mo one of the most beautiful, but also most horrifying elements in any historical writing anywhere. Melos breaks, is a city in the Athenian, is a, an island in the Athenian Empire. It's small, it's not, doesn't have a big army. And the Athenians are really upset about the fact that the Melians have broken away because it's a bad precedent to set. You know, their entire empire could fall apart if they put up with this. So they sent an army in to subjugate Melos and bring them back into the fold. And there's a very, very lucid and precise dialogue between the Athenian ambassadors and the, uh, the rulers or the most important figures in Melian politics. <clears throat> 
And what's interesting about this is that it's constructed as a set of antitheses. It reminds me very much of the dialogue we see in the contemporary tragedian Euripides. Because in Euripides, it's a kind of cynical but very realistic view of the of human condition. People are often rather brutal rather than heroic. And also, there's a kind of cynicism and irony here. What we get, and what's interesting also is we get direct discourse. At the beginning of each speech, there's ATH for Athenians and MEL for Melians. I mean, it really looks like the script to a, a play. And in some respects, it is, if you stop and think about what Thucydides' method is like. Well, what happens in the Melian dialogue is the Athenians come in and say, hey, look, you're part of the empire, and if you don't like it, that's tough, because we're going to kill all of you. Check it out. So that's the brass tax of it. So now, we'll give you two choices. You can do exactly what you're told. You can surrender to us at our discretion. You can come back to the empire, and you can knuckle under, or you can be dead. And they said, before we, we get any further, we don't want to hear any jazz about hope, or any nonsense about righteousness, or any of that stuff, because it's hogwash. That's not the way politics really works. So rather than give you some song and dance about the fact that the gods like Athens and that they're supporting our cause and all the rest of that hogwash, let's get down to brass tacks. We have a big army, and you have a little army, and there's nothing more to talk about. We're surrounding your city, and we are going to kill you. And we're going to kill your family, and we're going to kill everybody you're connected to. So the fact of the matter is that either you submit or you die. And the Melians start talking about justice. And they say, shut up, I don't want to hear about justice. And they start talking about hope. And they said, don't give me any hope. And they say, well, maybe we'll get support from the Spartans. And they say, look, we've taken care of that. You're not getting any support from anybody. Well, the way it finishes is that they have this back and forth, and eventually they go back and decide to be virtuous and patriotic and fight for their city. And they all get killed. Every man in Milos is exterminated in that battle. They kill them either in battle or the ones they capture as prisoners, they kill them. Their women and children are all sold into slavery. There are no millions. That is what makes Thucydidean history Thucydidean. The rigorous insistence that the world is as it actually is. He's not going to sugarcoat the lessons of politics. You can see why this would appeal to someone like Hobbes. You could see why this would appeal to someone like Machiavelli. And also why it would be influential. Because what Thucydides is doing here is not inventing history, because Herodotus invented history about a generation before. Not as rigorous, but he does have this, this idea of research into the past to find out about the human condition. What's important about Thucydides, and I'll close with this, is that Thucydides is the first social scientist. He thinks that human nature being what it is, when you get into roughly the same situation as the Melians, you're better off surrendering and not getting killed. Why? Because well, look what happened to the Melians. You think you're different? Don't give me this jazz about hope and justice. That's not the way the world works. So Thucydides offers us a glimpse into some eternal human reality, some being in the flux and change of politics. And this being is edifying, if not always pleasing, if not always hopeful. And what Thucydides offers us, and it was not offered to just us, think about the American founding fathers. Why don't we have a direct democracy? They read their Thucydides. Right? And they said, it's a dangerous thing. We've got to find that balance. So Thucydides is the first and most important of the social sciences. We owe to him the whole tradition of social science, the scientific non-mythological understanding of politics and war and the human condition, which is characteristic of the most sophisticated of our inquiries into the human condition today. Thank you.